Oh, hey, didn't see you there. We're here at Baker Implement in Peggett, Arkansas. Let's go check it out. How's it going? Good, how are you? Doing good. Luke Bud, Carter. Bud Hilburn. Good to meet you. You want to show me around the shop a yeah, little bit? Welcome to Baker Implement in Peggett. Uh, we got Parks Department here with Heaven, Scott, and Tim. And then uh, we got a full line of steel, chainsaws, and blowers. And then um, back here we got the shop. Steels, that's all I use. That's good. It's a good product. Yeah. We got Doug Deckard. He's the manager here. How you doing there, I'm Doug? doing fine. Doing, doing fine. Good to meet you. We got a bunch of stuff going on this time of year in the shop uh, between getting ready for harvest with hay and combines, and then we got tractors that have been in the field every day that are broken down. Uh, so it's all the time a different different grind every day of what we're gonna have to fix. I so. bet, looks like you got a lot of tractors in here. Yeah, yeah, we got a good crew. Uh, everybody here, we got, a, we got, I think the best crew in back room and in the shop anyway. Uh, these guys get it done every day. Uh, we got dirt tractors Heck. from moving dirt with engines out to combines to everything in between. Y'all stay busy like this pretty much yeah, all summer? Yeah, all summer long. Uh, we'll be working on combines all summer trying to get ready. Uh, I can introduce some of these guys. All right. This is Dawson, he just got out of school. What's up Dawson, how you doing? Good, how are you? Good, you're gonna be a star. Thank you, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then we got Nolan and Tom. How are you? Nolan, how you doing buddy? Good. And then this is Eric Weeks. He's already. How you doing, Tom? You gonna say anything for the camera? No, thank you. All right. <laughs> this is Eric Weeks. He's the service manager. Eric, how you doing? Good to meet you. Good to meet you. He's the one that makes all this madness come together at once. Uh, he's got something new every day, so we're thankful for him. So you're the mad scientist. Something like that. Okay. Right here, we're uh, mounting up some brand new ATI tracks to 9250 combine. It's a Chrome Edition combine. It's our latest and greatest. That's beautiful. So you putting this, putting these on this machine right yep, here? Yep. That'll give them more flotation going through the field and a better ride because they're fully suspended. Awesome. Very cool. Very cool. All right, we're here at Pig at Arkansas Baker Implement, and I'm here with Bud Hilburn. Bud, appreciate you showing us around the shop yeah, today. Thank you guys for coming. Bud's a fifth generation employee of the family here at Baker Implement. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, so my great-great-grandpa, Mr. Baker, started Baker Implement back in 1938, and then I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I wanted to do something ag-related. That's kind of what my family's into, and so it ended up, uh, came to Piggott, didn't really know too much about Piggott growing up. Um, we didn't get to buy the Piggott store until 2012, but it's uh, by far our biggest store, most productive store. There's always something going on, and if it's, we, we kind of say all roads lead to Piggott. Um, anytime that there's something that we can't figure out or some big deal with, with Inback Rampment at kind of headquarters here because we got a great staff and a great atmosphere here to get stuff done. Awesome. Yeah, it's been popping the whole time we've been here, and we appreciate your hospitality. Yeah, yeah. Appreciate Thank you guys you for coming around. out. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you, man. It's my pleasure today to welcome Paul T. Combs and Jerry Paul Combs, the owners of Baker Implement Company. Been wanting to interview you guys for a long time. Yeah. Welcome to the show. Thank you, glad to be here. I'm excited yeah, about you. this show. This is one of my most exciting shows, I think, because I've been wanting to do this for a long time. So Paul T., tell us a little bit about yourself, where you grew up, where you went to college, your family. Okay. 
Um, I grew up in Kennett, Missouri, uh, born there in 1965, went to Kennett High School, went to the University of Missouri, majored in accounting, and went to work for a couple of years at the Price Waterhouse accounting firm. And then my dad recruited me to come back in the implement business in the late 80s and been there ever since. Got a wife and two children. Both my children live in the Washington, D.C. area, but um, still happily married. Your wife's Holly, right? My wife's Holly. I think I've met That's her right. one time. And I've got a daughter, Meredith, and a son, Hayden. Well, Jerry Paul, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, my name is Jerry Combs. I was born and raised in Portageville, Missouri. Went to the University of Missouri. Uh, majored in real estate. Got a job with General American Life Insurance Company. Offered, did not accept it in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, married a girl from Kennett named Ecky Jo Brown and her father and her grandfather recruited me to come back to Kennett in lieu of going to Tucson, Arizona and go into the farm equipment business instead of going to Tucson and being in the real estate business, uh, managing apartments, many malls and this type of thing that General American Life Insurance was in and they had real estate all over the country. Uh, that's the best decision I ever made. Uh, I've been real happy in the implement business and uh, my brother-in-law got out of college at the same time I did, so we moved both moved back to Kennett at the same time. I went in the implement business, he went in the insurance business, uh, he passed away a year or so ago and was very successful in the insurance business. And I've been very happy in the implement business. I've been there for, I was in that business for 40 years and then decided after I retired that I wanted to farm a little just to have something to do. Uh, so I started farming 500 acres and still farming, still happy and still have an office at the implement company and Paul T. and them let me come in there every day, and as long as I don't give advice, I'm welcome. If I start coaching too much, I think they'd find someplace else for me to go. So Jerry Paul, before we start talking about the history of Baker Implement Company, I think we should understand kind of the family tree of Baker Implement. Can you tell us the kind of the family history, the family tree of uh, your family? Yeah, uh, Baker Implement Company was started by Charles B. Baker, who was my wife's grandfather, would have been my grandfather-in-law. And he started the company in 1938, uh, started the corporation in 1942, and he actually ran the company until about 1964, when I came back into the company from college. And about that same time, his son-in-law, T.A. Brown Jr., who is my wife's father, was running the company. And he ran the company until probably 1975 to 80, somewhere in that neighborhood. And I just gradually moved into the management and running of it. It wasn't any one day you're the manager and one day you're not. It just evolved. And then... I ran the company for 30 years and in 2006, um, I decided I was 65 years old. Paul T is home, he'd been there long enough. He was capable of running the company. And uh, so in 2006, I retired. Paul T started running it. I quit going to the other stores. I quit coaching as best I could. And uh, that's got us till today. So from 1964 to 1975, it was just kind of a natural progression that you became the manager of the Baker Yeah, Company. I think it was probably a 10 year progression. Um, but you knew at that time you were gonna be the, the guy in charge by that time. Yes. There wasn't anybody else trying out for it or no. anybody jockeying no, to be the manager. I, I pretty well had everybody convinced that I was gonna be there. So over the years, uh, Mr. Baker, Mr. Brown, uh, what kind of advice did they give you about managing these stores? Because you start out with one, now you have 11. So 
you told me he was the smartest guy that you've known, better manager than you or Paul T. So what kind of advice or what type of style did he have? Okay, Mr. Baker was the entrepreneur uh, of this, of our family. And he's the one that got everything started. And he's the one that did a lot of things for a lot of people. And he was just, he was an excellent businessman. My father-in-law was a really good businessman, but he was very, very conservative. He wanted to be, when he got up in the morning, he wanted to be worrying about what the CD rate was. He didn't want to, and he was just absolutely paranoid about borrowing money. That is good, but it stifles your growth, in my opinion. He'd be very upset at the CD now, rate today. My, that's right. <laughs> that's the reason the growth of the company kind of started with me as far as the implement company mm -hmm. expanding. My father-in-law wasn't interested in expanding at all. He was real happy. He just wanted to make as much money as he could make with what he had. I just wanted to do a little more. And the first time that Baker Implement had to borrow any money was after we had purchased about three stores. And all of a sudden we just didn't have enough capital to operate on anymore and so I started borrowing money, and Mr. Brown just, he just couldn't hardly stand it. He'd just say, why do you want to do it? I don't understand. He thought you were breaking on minute. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and, Take a lot of risk. But he didn't, he turned it over to me. He said, you, you're going to be doing it, but don't come ask me to sign any notes. And uh, so my style then was, I didn't have any problems borrowing money as long as we could, had the cash flow to pay it back. Uh, so that was one of the big changes. Mr. Baker, I said something to him one time. I said, Mr. Baker, I said, uh, you have any problem with us borrowing money? He said, oh my God, boy, I borrowed lots of money. <laughs> and he did. I mean, it, it, the way he did things. Uh, Paul T. doesn't mind borrowing money either. So it's the American we, way, right? American way, that's right. We, we not had to slow down <laughs> under his management style. <laughs> So in 1938, Mr. Baker started his very first international harvester store, correct? That's correct. During Missouri. Yes. So what kind of recollections do you have of that? I'm sure you probably heard a lot of stories about it growing up. The implement company didn't make that big a push and was not that much in the news until they started selling cotton pickers. And then Mr. Baker probably was the most successful original cotton picker dealer in the United States, with the exception of maybe Clarksdale, Mississippi. But the two of those did a good job. And Mr. Baker sold cotton pickers all over this part of the country with nothing down, financed them for the farmers, and they paid so much, a hundred for every bill that they picked. And if that made the payment fine, if it didn't make it, it, made, it was fine. He just wanted to be sure that they had enough cotton to pay him if they made a decent crop. Sounds like a smart guy. And, He's in the cotton uh, business. So he mm -hmm. was very, very successful and made a big splash in the implement company and almost got tarred and feathered and run out of town because he's putting everybody out of a job picking mm -hmm. cotton. Uh, so I'm going to think my history in that, I think was the biggest thing he did for his name moving forward was the way he introduced cotton picker to this part of the country. So the mechanical mechanical cotton picker, he's one, the first person to introduce those That's right, international right. pickers. What what models were those? They were all add-on pickers that if you had an H farm all or an M, M farm all or a C farm all, you bought an attachment to mount on your existing tractor. And then when the season was over, they would take that cotton picking machine off the tractor turn the gears back around and use the tractor to farm all so year So when those with. 1953 Super M's come out, everybody thought they were driving Cadillacs. In. That's right. That's right. And they would put cotton pickers on it and then take the cotton pickers off. And the employees at Baker Emma Company would spend the biggest part of August and the first part of September mounting cotton pickers. 
So how did we get from Deering, Missouri, downtown Deering, Missouri, to buying the store in Kennett, Missouri? Or did we start that store from scratch? No, we moved it from Deering to Kennett. And like I said, Mr. Baker was a big entrepreneur. So they had the implement company that put in Kennett. They had a gas company they put in Kennett. They had a Delta building company that they put in Kennett. They had insurance company in Kennett. Uh, what am I missing? That irrigation. Irrigation in company in Kennett. And, and, uh, and, and so that's, that's where they were, so that became home. Gotcha, that's home base. That's yeah. where they were living. So they, they became city slickers in Kennett. They moved out of the country at Deering then, right? Well, I don't know that they ever lived in Deering. Deering. Gotcha. Yeah. So, Paul T., I want to get you involved in this conversation. Okay. When did you realize that you are born into a big Baker implement family and your family sold far more. Well, our our families always lived in Kennett, so we had a pretty pretty good sized family in Kennett. And then um, I grew up with my dad working at the implement company, and so and I liked to drive tractors and lawnmowers and things. So I would just go out there on Saturdays and go out and work there during the summers, and just kind of grew up in the in the business and and liked it. And so uh, when I was with an accounting firm, they had family had a chance to buy the places at Blyville and Osceola and my dad recruited me to come back then because they needed some more people and and so they were shifting people around and so it made a spot for me to shoe into Kennett and uh, I convinced my wife to come to Kennett right after we were married instead of going to St. Louis like I'd promised her. So That was probably a pretty big deal. It was it? a big deal. She was from southwest Missouri and <laughs> there weren't quite as many trees over here. So Jerry Paul how did we get to Kennett, Missouri, we, they've shut Deering's store down, correct? Well, Was Deering still I, operating I, in 1942? Uh, they just incorporated and moved to Kennett. And just set it up as a separate business. Hey guys, we're here in Kennett, Missouri, Baker Implement. Let's go inside and check it out. Hey guys, we're here at Baker Implement in Kennett, Missouri, and I'm here with Mr. John Pate. John, it's good to meet you today. Uh, I hear you've been with Baker for quite some time. Yes, yeah, started in high school in 1971. 1971, so how many years have you been here? Well, that'd be 50 years. 50 years. Sure, yeah, this 50 is, years. This is the year I'm gonna retire. Awesome, uh, so what's kept you here for so long? Well, uh... Mostly the job, but uh, no, uh, I really enjoy what I do. I started out in the parts department when I was a kid, putting up stock and what have you during high school and what have you, and decided to stay on afterwards. And uh, I've uh, just kind of went up the ranks and parts manager now. And I've watched this company grow from when I started, it was two stores it was us and Arbord, Missouri and uh, they've been growing. They're up to 11 locations right now from wow. uh, Cape Girardeau all the way down to Oak Hill, Arkansas. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, it was good to meet you today here on your 50th anniversary this year, and it's been a pleasure meeting you and talking to you today, and, and uh, thanks for talking with us. All right. I appreciate you having me. Thank you. We're back here at Baker Implement in Kennett, Missouri, and I'm here with Mr. Joey Crisciani. Nice to meet you. Joey, good to meet you. Um, how long you been with Baker Implement? 43 years. 43 years. Yes. What, I, got, what got you started here? Well, my dad worked for Baker Implement, and he worked up at the old place at the railroad track uptown. Mm -hmm. And when they moved out here in the 60s, I would come out with him as a kid on weekends and stuff. And then when I was in 11th grade, my brother, was the janitor here and when he went to college then I came and I've been here ever since then and awesome. they're very good people to work for. Awesome I'm guessing that's part of the reason why you've been here for 43 years. That's right, right. and I knew Mr. Baker the founder uh, I talked to the grandkids that didn't know him about it some mm -hmm. of the grandkids are working here now and I tell him what tell him what an awesome guy he was he was just a superman Awesome, that's fantastic. I've been through most of the family members here. I'm, I'm sure you've seen it all. 43 years, you've seen every bit of it. A lot of changes in them years. That's right. Well, it's guys like you and, and, and guys who've been here a long time that, that help keep businesses going, and I'm sure they appreciate you. 
and we appreciate you meeting with us today. Uh -huh. We appreciate your time, uh -huh. and uh, thanks for showing us around. No problem. Have a good one. So, Paul T., let me get this straight. So, Deering really wasn't an implement store. You were just, they were just kind of selling to their neighbors, Mr. Baker, and everybody was just selling to neighbors. That's right. Mr. Baker had bought this plantation, Deering Farms, in 1936 from International Harvester Company, and they started peddling a little iron in the late 30s, 1938, or his company lore, and they were selling primarily to their tenants. And Mr. Baker saw that that could be, mechanization was coming into farming and they saw that that could be a big enough business to stand on its own. So they kind of incorporated in 1942 and established Baker Implement Company as its own entity, separate from Deering Farms, and moved it to Kennett. And then they had this implement company in Kennett and then this farm out here at Deering and they could still sell to their own farmers, but they were trying to sell to farmers at some of these other, other farms. So in, in 1938, mm -hmm. Technically, Baker Implement was formed, but really it didn't incorporate it, it until was, 1942. Correct. It was just a subsidiary of Deering Farms. So he was a true entrepreneur way back when there, we didn't even have the word entrepreneur. That's correct. Back then. He, had, he had gotten into you know selling gas to people in Deering, and that became a separate company. And selling a little, you know, he, a lot of companies spun off of that Deering that Deering plantation that was originally bought in '36. He had the vision and foresight to see this coming, where most people didn't. Right. We've well, got a little history from Deering over well, we here. Well, we do. Right? Uh, we got this is this is what they called uh, brosine, that was uh, uh, it was their own form of money. And it says you'll see on here it says Deering Farms Incorporated, and it's got my great grandfather Charles B. Baker's signature. And anyway, they paid part of their uh, their tenants. They were paying so much in cash and so much in brosine, and the brosine was only good at the company store. So. Um, they kind of had their own own deal going back then with the company stores and the brosine, and, and they weren't the only ones. The Stillmans had the same deal at Peach Orchard and the Hempills at Kennett and some others. I remember but, I have a Gideon Anderson coin. So there's, there's Gideon Anderson yes. coin. There's the Delta Realty Company at Catron. Other other people had the same type deal, but that's that's the way business was done in the in the 30s and 40s. That was really the true model back then. Almost it all was. these small farm towns, right? Right, and they were they, uh, you know, it get, some of it times it gets a bad rap. Uh, uh, you know, it was only good at the company store, but by the same time they were they were oftentimes carrying the farmers throughout the year, and and um, so they were there wasn't a, uh, there wasn't as many social net programs as we have today. Mm -hmm. So they were relying on the people that that were operating these farms to to take care of the families that's, during the that's winter. A, that's a great family heirloom there. It is. Jerry Paul, tell us about Mr. Baker, 1936. He had a successful season in 1937. He gave it all back. Uh, yeah, Mr. Baker bought Deering Farms from International Harvester Company in 1936. And the story t he tells is that he made enough money in 1936 to pay off the debt on the farm that he purchased in one year. Then in 1937, they had a flood. He was on a world cruise with his family and they didn't have near the communications on that trip that they do now. So he really wasn't aware that they were having a disaster here with a flood all over Southeast Missouri. But he said he lost so much, enough money in 1937 that it took him 10 years to pay it off. And then he went on, kept buying farmland, and then wound up later. He was a very successful farmer, but it wasn't as easy to pay for as it was to pay for it when he bought it. So that's the reason he told you he knew how to borrow money then, probably. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That might be the reason Mr. Brown was more conservative. He he saw the bad times. He 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 remembered the depression. He was holding the farm together while Mr. Baker was gone in '37, and he didn't want anything to do with owing anybody any money. I don't blame him. So Jerry Paul, how did we get from? Did you become an official international harvester dealer in 1942? Yes. So that's when it became official. Right. Uh, Mr. Baker kind of started in 38, selling to his neighbors. Then he woke up one day and said, wow, I've got a vision. I'm going to start selling to everybody. 
1948, I mean 1942, he opened the Kennett store. Was it successful immediately? Was it a? I, I think it was successful immediately. Uh, but the cotton picker was the big turning point. I mean, you know, going from mules to tractors mm -hmm. was a big deal, and tractors were very popular. International Harvester was a very popular tractor, and so it was a successful operation. But when the invention of the cotton picker is when Baker Implement Company really came to the front. And the way he marketed the cotton picker was a big deal. Uh, did we cover that earlier? Uh, you know, of selling it with nothing down, let the farmer pay it with his crop. And so that was a big deal and then we kind of stayed, we opened a store in Arbird after that, and then we were a two-store operation Arbird for was many 1948, years. right? 1948 yes. was Arbird? Yeah. We didn't really talk about that, so he didn't, he was, he was okay borrowing money, but it sounds like he was the bank for a lot of customers. Well, he, he financed a lot of people that were farming themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, he started the store in Arbird, didn't have to borrow any money to do it. Uh, at that time, they just, if you had two of anything, you almost had two corporations. So they incorporated Harbert as a different corporation. It was called Baker Truck and Implement Company versus Baker Implement Company. But those two stores were all we had until 1971. And then in 1971, we had an opportunity to expand into Crothersville, and we bought that dealership. And then it just it just kind of dominoed. We did not have a vision that we're going to have five stores in five years or ten stores in five years. It was just the phone would ring then that one day and somebody'd want to sell us a store and we'd be interested and we could make it work. And so the expansion wasn't planned. It just kind of presented evolved, itself evolved. and evolved. And we were ahead of the game on the multiple stores. Uh, in 1994, 95, 96, uh, we were probably the second largest dealership in the United States by number of locations. There was one in Louisiana that had 19 stores we may have had eight or nine at that time, but we were way ahead of the curve. And uh, the multi-store concept, we didn't necessarily buy stuff from Case any cheaper than anybody else, but everything we could do, we could do more efficiently with multiple stores than we could with one. And we were able to do that in, in 1996. We were the top selling dealer in North America for International Harvester Company. And since then, we've added just a few stores, but we've added some. Uh, but the concept of multiple stores with Case and with John Deere has exploded. Yes. And now the multi store is a, you know, it's just the way everything's going. It's what everybody's doing. They're getting bigger. Uh, a lot of them are publicly held. Um, it's, it's a different concept. You know, you got a store now that has 40 locations uh, where we, we're still working with 11. Uh, but uh, it, uh, just we were we grew real fast and the limiting factor to this in most cases is capital it just takes a lot of capital and if you're going to get very big you're going to have to go public when you do that you have to lose a lot of control so there's a lot of decisions that Paul T's going to have to make that I won't have to worry about if we're going to stay in this business of whether we're happy with 11 stores or we want 40. That's a tough challenge. It is. 
you'd have to navigate that over the next 10 to 20 years or maybe shorter than that. But let's get into your stores. Okay. Did you build any of your stores from the ground up? Like the Arbird store in 1948, was it? Did y'all build any of the structures, or were they? It, did y'all buy existing structures? No, we we built that structure, but that but every every other operation after that, we we bought out bought, somebody. bought out somebody else. And you have eleven stores. And now, we have correct? eleven stores now in Arkansas, and we, Missouri. In Missouri, and we've added on to some of the structures that we've purchased, but we've very none have we built from the ground up. Now, Kenneth, it's also like a parts and hardware type store. You can buy a lot of things there. There's right? there's a there's a separate company that my sister and her husband run. It's called Baker Farm and Hardware. That 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 originally started as a farm supply store where you could buy things other than equipment and parts for equipment. Uh, back in the day, it started as sweeps for cultivators and disc blades and things. When there was a lot more tillage and fewer chemicals, there was uh, there we. The, the the farm and hardware business was getting a bigger share of the wallet than the chemical companies are. That's kind of reversed now with the with the advent of precision chemicals and seed. So it's evolved into cultivator sweeps to spray tips. To spray tips, yes. that's correct. So Paul T, you've probably done every job in the store from the ground floor up over the years. When you're probably in high school, in college, I mean, I'm sure you got to sweep the floors when you started. Mm -hmm. Now you're running the whole business. How's that evolved for you over the years from a personal level? I knew, I knew from working in the shop that I didn't want to be a mechanic. I, I'm not very mechanical, and so it didn't take long uh, punching roll pins into gears that are in cotton picker bars, inner shafts, to know that I didn't want to be in the service department. So I tried to, I tried to work up front in the, in the parts, to, and in the summer it was cooler in the parts department than it was in the service department. So I tried to work in parts, and that's what I did mostly in high school. But uh, it, it did help to learn various aspects of the business. And then I studied accounting in, in college and helped out some in the office when I was in college. And then when I came back, I started trying to learn the selling part of it from my dad. Were you a big pusher behind expansion when you started uh, working there full time? I, I was. My dad had the vision to expand and, and I was always encouraging of it. You know, if, if uh, I remember we were trying to buy the store at Portageville, Missouri and, and uh, he had he had reached his limit, and I was like, "Why don't we go? Why don't we go talk to him one more time and see if we can't get this done?" <laughs> and so, uh, so it, it's it's been fun. But uh, dad dad was in charge when 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 we bought most of the places. But there have been a couple. The last two that we did at Piggott and at at Poplar Bluff that that although dad had retired, I certainly sought his advice on it. But we I handled most of that. So whenever you buy a store, though, mm -hmm. you're an accountant. You have to look at the numbers. Uh, what went into your decision making? Did, like your past experience with the other stores? Past experience with the other stores, and then in, in the case of most of the places we bought, they were pretty good operations. And you know, we when we bought the Piggott store, it was one of the bigger Case IH places in in this part of the country. And we just tried not to mess it up. You know, we kept we were able to keep most all of the existing employees. And we, we saw that they had been very successful um, as a single store competing with us with, with 10. And, you know, in, in some of these places, you just try not to mess, you know, you try not to mess it up when you buy something good. It's like buying a good farm and trying not to mess it up. I remember all these stores have a story even before y'all bought some of them. Like, I remember my brother Bobby worked for y'all for many years, but he also worked for the Nelsons at one time. And, yeah. The Popper Bluff store was it still owned by Nelson? It was. At the it time? was owned by the Nelsons when we when we bought it. And uh, Mike and Dick Nelson, two brothers that had been in the in the case business, and then had had gotten the international piece of it after the merger. And Dick Nelson uh, died, and Mike Nelson was his brother and was and ran it for several years. And and I dealt with Mike when he he was he was at the point of retirement, had some uh, daughters that were not interested in the business, and so. We were able to make a deal with him and and the trustee of his brother's trust when we bought that store. And there's a lot of personalities that work at each location. We're going to be yeah. talking to a few of them throughout this show. We're right. going to be splicing their interviews in on this show. Mm -hmm. But like Max Clark's been with you for how long? Oh, Max has been with us as long, almost as long as I've been at Baker Hamlet Company. He started as a mechanic in Kennett. He was the service manager at our store at, at Portageville, Missouri. And then he ended up managing the store at Malden, Missouri. So he's he's been around, uh, you know, as, as long as I have. All right, we're at another Baker implement. This time we're in Malden, Missouri, and it's very windy. Malden.
Malden Baker Implement. Just kidding. What's up, Max? Hey, buddy. How you doing, man? All right, how are you doing, sir? You doing all right? Doing good, how are you? All right. You want to do a pellet, you can have it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> hey, we're here at Baker Implement in Malden, Missouri with Mr. Max Clark. Max, how you doing today? Doing fine, sir. We appreciate you letting us come in. and Thank look, you for coming. Look through the store. Tell us a little bit about uh, what you do here. Well, I'm the store manager. I've been here in this store since 1999 as store manager. And uh, I worked at Kennett for several years. You know, when I hired in, it was at Kennett, mm -hmm. right out of high school. And that was in 1983. And worked there several years, and then moved from, uh, was in the parts department on John Pate and Harry Rogers. Mm -hmm. Got to work with Mr. Baker, and Mr. Brown, and Jerry Paul, and Paul T was in school. And then uh, we, uh, after a few years, they moved me in the shop. And then Jerry Paul started buying some other locations. And I worked in Pickers, mainly. And they migrated up to Portageville. And that's where I stayed at until they started making some changes over the year. And then I come here in 99. Awesome. So I've been manager ever since then. So, awesome. That's good. What, yeah. what makes you enjoy working for, for Baker Inc.? Well, it started out when I was young. You know, when you get married and everything, you start out trying to make a living and mm -hmm. then stuff. And uh, went through a few places uh, when I was young. And then, you know, for about a year. And then I hired in at Baker's. And it's always been family operated. I mean, they take care of you. It's been a good family operation. Uh, Jerry Paul's been a great boss. I learned a lot from all of them. Paul T's a great boss and just family. You mm -hmm. just enjoy getting up every day and going to work. That so, seems like a, a common sentiment we get from everybody yeah. we've talked to yeah. today. I got one big question that's been bugging me all day. Okay. What exactly do you guys implement here? What types of policies? Kind of what? They like the policies that the, the keeps everybody Baker here? implementation. What do you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Our deal, you know, at Bakers, you know, is you know, like I said, uh, you got to go to a job that you actually enjoy and love, mm -hmm. and that you know, the places, you know, Paul T and M and Jerry Paul and Mr. Baker always had the same real customers number one. Yeah. Mr. Baker actually told me that when I was first there. You know, I mean, they installed. Mr. Brown really installed it, and uh, Jerry Paul's always been. It's business, but mm -hmm. it's also family. And when you got that, and we got the best customer, we don't have like Walmart clientele. They're just not gonna fly in. We got the same customer, so you gotta take care of them or somebody else will. Mm -hmm. And that's the way they've always installed it. So it makes me wanna get up and sell, cause you're gonna see the same guys basically all the time and everything. And you take care of them, they take care of us. And it's just kept working and working. and. It's always been a good deal. And, uh, and when you have family trouble at home, you know, everybody's going to have that sickness or something. Baker's always been right there to take care of you. They've never, you know, they support you. So I think it's got lost in the world, but it's mm -hmm. not at Baker Inman. It's That's a great fantastic. place to work. That's so, fantastic. Well, yeah. Max, we appreciate everything. We appreciate the yeah. hospitality and you sitting down talking with us today. And, yeah, appreciate and, it. And appreciate you showing us around. Well, I appreciate y'all. Thank you very much. And we've got a gentleman that's going to retire this summer named John Pate in our parts department at Kennett who started working for my great-grandfather when he was in high school and is in, in the 1970s and is going to retire this year and he's never worked anyplace else. We've got another one at Kennett, Joey Krishani, who started working at Baker Implement Company when he was in high school and has spent his whole career with us. So we're fortunate to have people that have spent their whole careers with us and then people who have spent their careers at some of these other stores that we've bought. You've, you you guys have employed a lot of people over the years. How many people work at Baker Implement? About 180 now at, at any one time, and 180, 185, you know. But um, we've been fortunate. We've never, we've, we're in a cyclical business, but we've never had a layoff. We've had attrition. It's been, we don't have a lot of attrition, but we've had people come and go. We've had people leave us. We've had people leave us and come back. But we've been fortunate that we've got a pretty stable um, base of, of, of employees and, and we try to make it a fun place to work. Well, like I said, every store has a story behind it mm -hmm. and there's a lot of personalities in each store. But Jerry Paul, uh, I didn't know about this story though, but you owned the Portageville store twice, is that right? Yes, uh, we bought it first time in 1971. Joe McCrae called me, he has five children and said the kids decided they wanted to sell the store. They'd rather have the money as the business. 
we purchased it, went over there, told all employees we'd purchased it, sent the letter out to all of the customers that we'd purchased it. And the next weekend, one of his daughters was getting married in St. Louis, and the two boys, Bob McCrate, Terry McCrate, they didn't want to sell, and they talked some of their siblings into joining forces with them and buying the business if they could get it back from me. Well, Mr. Joe McCrate calls me on the phone and says, I've got a favor to ask of you, and you don't have to do it. It's a big one. And he it? told me the story and uh, said that the kids wanted to buy the store, and he was telling me that I did not have to sell them to him. Said he was a big boy, and he sold it to me fair and square. I did everything I was supposed to do. If you want to charge them a profit, if you want to just let them have it back, or if you don't want to let them have it back, it's your decision. Well, I was raised with all these kids, right? Mm -hmm. Two blocks down the street from me. So I said, look, if they want to buy it, that's fine with me. We'll just back out. Yeah, they don't owe me anything. And so that's what we did. The kids took it. The only thing I ask them is if they ever decide to sell it again, to give us a shot at it. And eight years later, they did. And so we bought it again, a second time. And that was one of the most interesting purchases. And everybody thought I was silly around home and around our family that we would let them have it back because we were delighted to have it bought. But it was the right thing to do. Sounds like he, Mr. McCrate was a man of his word, though. Without a doubt. He kept his word. You kept your yeah. word back. So and it worked, it, and really it worked out in the long run. And so, Paul, T, tell me how Case H has evolved over the years. And let me preface it with this. I remember Ramsey's in Parma, Missouri, mm -hmm. my hometown, was a dominant force in International Harvester back in the 70s and 80s, maybe the 60s, but I don't remember back then. Um, and International got merged or bought out by Tenneco. So it right. became Case H. So mm -hmm. tell us, even in your lifetime, how that's evolved over the years? Well, International Harvester, there were a lot of International Harvester dealers in the boot heel and fewer case dealers, and primarily because International Harvester had a cotton picker and case didn't. And long story short, International Harvester got into financial trouble in the early 80s, and they, they Tenneco bought them, and Tenneco had already bought case, and they put the two together, and then, they had to make a decision as to who was going to represent the brand in these different communities in Southeast Missouri and all over the country. As it turned out, there were a lot of strong international harvester dealers like Mr. Ramsey, but Case was the company that had won the battle and, 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 had, and, and was in control. And so in most cases, they awarded the, the contract to the Case dealer, the dealer who had been representing the Case brand up to that point we were fortunate in that we were one of the few, we were the only dealer from Memphis to St. Louis that was an international harvester dealer that got the combined Case IH contract. And I think that's a testimony to, to Baker Implement Company and the job that my dad and grandfather were doing running the company at the time. But in, in 1985, our world was kind of shook upside down because a lot of these people like Mr. Ramsey assumed they were gonna get the business and as they started going, we were one of the last people they visited, but as they started going through our area, all of these real strong international harvester dealers were out of business. And we're like, whoa, this could, you know, this could be us. And so we were trying to make contingency plans and things like that. But um, as it turned out, they, they, they did award us a contract. And then we had a good relationship with the company from then. In other words, we, we em embraced the new management. They, uh, they had a guy that was very hungry for market share and, and wanted to stick it to John Deere. And uh, it didn't take us long to get with the program. <laughs> and so it, was, it turned out to be a, what was a, a, an ominous deal at first turned out to be a very good deal for our family. So were you in panic mode when all this happened? Yes. Uh, when it originally started, we international harvester dealers, we just knew all of us were gonna get the contract because they were much stronger. There wasn't a strong case dealer in the whole bunch. But when they started at Memphis working this way, the very first one they went to was Wynn, Arkansas. Exceptional case dealer there. 
took him out, gave it to the case dealer. Then they started on up the road, Osceola. They had one in uh, uh, Blyville. And then they kind of skipped over us and started on up north, Charleston, up in there. Every one of them getting case dealers. We just, we were confident, but we just didn't know how it was going to work. I never will forget, the case representatives came in the office and there was a case man and a international harvester. The case man was in charge. They came in, they said, look, said we're considering you all and we're considering the case store here in town, in Kennett. The case dealer had about a $700,000 used inventory of tractors. They had been getting all of the business for the last two years and they wanted to know if we would buy that used inventory if they awarded this contract. I was doing the talking. Mr. Baker and Mr. Brown were there, but I was the one they were talking to. And I said, no, well, we won't. Talked a little bit, and they said, well, would you buy half of it? I said, no, sir. We won't buy one used tractor. I said, he sold every tractor that's been sold in this trade territory for the last two years, and we're not going to spend our money bailing him out. <laughs> and uh, they, now, we'd already decided that earlier. I didn't make it <laughs> on the spot. <laughs> but they were surprised. They huddled up a little bit together, turned around, said, we're going to give you the contract. We'll work out the deal with the case dealer. And they left our office. The case rep had already told the case dealer in town that he was going to get the contract, that we weren't going to get it. That word had kind of gotten back to us, and so we were scared to death that that's what's going to happen. One of the things that the man asked me, he said, what are you going to do if we don't award you this contract? And I said, we're going to get up in the morning trying to buy the John Deere store, and that's what we were going to try to do. We wanted to stay in the farm equipment business. So we got the contract. The other dealer didn't get it. They put him in business in Haiti. They bought out the existing international harvester dealer in Haiti, gave the contract that was in Kennett to Haiti, and so they just moved him to Haiti. And Mr. Brown was probably thinking, Jerry Paul's not going to have to borrow any money to buy all this. Future. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I guarantee that's what he was thinking. So, Paul T., you almost had to wear a John Deere cap, it sounds like. That's just, it sounds that way. I mean, that's things right. could have been so much different that's right. just that day, right? That's Worst right. things could have happened. Could have been a turning point in the whole right. Baker Implement yeah. family right there. Mm -hmm. But it's worked out for all it's of you. It's worked out. But y'all's legacy, what is? what do you think Baker Implement legacy is for future generations? Oh, I, I think our legacy is just trying to trying to help farmers in Southeast Missouri be successful. I mean, if if they're successful, we're successful. If we can if we can help customers be successful in agriculture, we'll, we'll be successful. Farmers, if they make money, we'll spend it, and they'll spend it with the implement dealers and the car dealers and and others. And so, if we can if we can do anything, if we can take care of our farmers and keep them in the field so they can make, make some money, it'll, it'll flow back to us. You're right, Paul T. Well, I want to thank you two guys for being here today. This is a historic business here in Southeast Missouri. It's been my pleasure and my privilege to document that history today. I hope I've done it justice and- We appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Keep on trucking. We'll do it. Jerry Paul, my honor. Thank you very much. Thank you. My pleasure, thank you. Appreciate it. Hey, we're here at Dexter Baker Implement in Dexter, Missouri with Mr. Mark Fouts. Mark, how you doing? Doing great. Good, Good. to see you. Good to see you. Hey, um, we've heard you've been with Baker for a long time. How many years have you been with Baker Implement? Oh, I hired in in December of 71 at our location in Arbor, Missouri, but didn't start work until right after the first of the year, mm -hmm. uh, January of 72. Uh, kept books down there for about mm, six, seven years and then went to a different location and uh, been with them ever since. Uh, awesome. Good company. What do you do here at Dexter? Um, I'm a retired store manager. I gave that up about uh, two years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, Blake Thomas is the new guy that took my place. And 
fortunate enough they're letting me stay on as sales and uh, kind of to help around any other deal I can help. So awesome. So uh, what's kept you with uh, Baker Implement this long? What's what's kept you here? It's a good company to work for. They're family oriented. Uh, they take care of you. They they care about your family, and uh, they they care about you. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't I can't say anything bad about them because they have uh, been good to me. I went through cancer and I've been through bypass surgery and they stayed with me the whole way. So um, just love the company. Well, we we spoke to a lot of people today and it seems like everybody we've talked to has that same sentiment about Baker Implement. So very good people to work for. Yes, sir. Well, we appreciate you showing us around the store today and we appreciate no, all your no time and, and it was great meeting you and great meeting your staff and and uh, appreciate all your time. Thank you very much. Thank you.